the decision to make nuclear weapons was taken before I became a member of the cabinet. I was shocked when I heard about it. I never liked the idea. I thought that this rumor that we are, that we have nuclear weapons was a negative factor in our fight against growing isolation. And always at the back of my mind, I had the aspiration to do something about this if ever I become president. So one of the first things I did was to call this group who knew about it together and to say to them, I think we should sign the non-proliferation agreement. We should get rid of the bombs and we should become part of the international community on this issue. Jonathan, uh, would you like to start off? Yes, hello. I'm so glad to host this meeting. I'm Jonathan Granoff. Um, we have three absolutely yeah. outstanding diplomats, three ambassadors to, uh, to uh, share with us today. This is the 30th anniversary of the announcement of South Africa to eliminate its nuclear arsenal. It is the only country in the world that has eliminated a nuclear arsenal that it That's created. It. Yeah. And uh, it was created, it was uh, eliminated because of a moral and practical convergence of insights. We have with us today um, uh, one of President de Klerk's, not one of, President de Klerk's most trusted colleague and advisor in the de Klerk Foundation, which they founded, Ambassador David Stewart. Ambassador Stewart uh, was a foreign service officer beginning in the 1960s in South Africa. He was the ambassador of South Africa to the United Nations, and he was the director general of President de Klerk's office while, while he was the head of state. I know him well as a senior advisor and active participant in the summits of the Nobel Peace Prize winners, where he is instrumental in crafting the collective statement of these extraordinary people. He himself, in my opinion, is an extraordinary gentleman. And uh, he, he, he's a diplomat, but um, he often borders on being a wise man and crosses the border often. Um, the next speaker we have is, uh, we have uh, Ambassador Sergio Duarte from Brazil. Ambassador Duarte was the United Nations representative for disarmament affairs. He was the, uh, a, a career diplomat from Brazil with postings in Austria, Croatia, Slovakia, China, Canada. Nicaragua, Switzerland, the United States, Argentina. To say he's a man of the world would be an understatement. He was the president of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in 2005. He is presently the, uh, the president of, uh, of the Pugwash Conferences, which is an organization which received the Nobel Peace Prize for its work in bridge building in the scientific community particularly during the Cold War and focusing on the elimination of nuclear weapons. It won the prize along with uh, Dr. Joseph Rotblat, uh, who was one of the people who helped found the Global Security Institute where I serve as president. Dr. Rotblat was the only scientist to walk off of the Manhattan Project, believing that once the heavy water facility in Norway uh, was destroyed and Nazi Germany could not build the bomb, that no one should build the bomb. And he serves as the president of that organization. 
And we also have Ambassador Thomas Graham. Ambassador Graham is unique in, in this field. Uh, it is fair to say that he was a principal senior participant, if not the primary negotiator, in uh, ev almost every major arms control agreement of the 20th century. That would include the strategic arms reduction treaties, the anti-ballistic missile treaty, the intermediate range nuclear forces treaty, the NPT was head of the US delegation for its indefinite extension, the treaty on conventional armed forces in Europe, the comprehensive test ban treaty, the biological weapons convention and the chemical weapons convention. He was an advisor in, in his expertise in law and arms control to numerous, uh, numerous pre President Nixon President Carter, President Reagan, President Bush, and President Clinton. Uh, it's fair to say that uh, his unique career uh, compels our listening carefully to his insights and suggestions. Um, I, I think that, uh, that I'd like to begin now with uh, Ambassador Stewart talking a little bit about his direct experience in uh, in eliminating these horrific devices. But I also want to say that um, I think that nuclear weapons are a, a barrier to the kind of world that we want to live in and puts the world at risk. But the, the immorality of apartheid uh, is a bar was a barrier amongst people. And, and uh, Ambassador Stewart was one of the people who helped tear down that uh, immoral wall and bring democracy and uh, and transformation peacefully to South Africa. Ambassador Stewart, please. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think that uh, F.W. de Klerk uh, will be remembered primarily for two things. Firstly, for introducing the constitutional transformation process that moved South Africa away from apartheid in the 1980s to the threshold of multiracial constitutional democracy. That's the one thing. The other thing for which he should be remembered is that he is thus far the only head of government or head of state anywhere in the world who has dismantled a nuclear weapons capability developed by his own country. Now, this is the 30th anniversary of that decision. And uh, I recall it very well. Uh, we had a special session of our parliament. None of the members of parliament, none of the journalists present knew what was up. They thought it was going to be an announcement relating to the constitutional negotiations that were reaching a very critical point at that time. And so I, I bet them that a bottle of scotch, they wouldn't guess. And they didn't guess it was this news, this unexpected announcement that South Africa had developed nuclear weapons and had then abolished them. But now I think that this is important, uh, not only for uh, F.W. de Klerk's legacy, but much more so for the, uh, the lessons that the international communi community can draw from this. Why do countries like South Africa develop nuclear weapons in the first place, and under what circumstances are they prepared to, to get rid of them? And South Africa, I think, is a, is a more or less a textbook case. It developed nuclear weapons because it felt threatened by the uh, intrusion of uh, Soviet Union into Southern Africa. It had no ally, so there was no nuclear umbrella for it. Uh, it was isolated. So uh, under those circumstances, it went ahead and developed a very small capability, six and a half weapons, by the time that uh, President de Klerk abolished them. Uh, President de Klerk himself thought it was a little bit crazy because there was no way that nuclear weapons could be of any help in the kind of of bush warfare in which South Africa had been involved. And so when, when he had the opportunity uh, to uh, 
make a difference, when he became president, one of the first things he did was to uh, order the dismantling of the weapons and uh, the steps that would be necessary for South Africa to join the NPT. And why did he do this? Why could he do this? I think there are a number of reasons. And the first one is that, of course, the threat had been removed. It had been removed primarily because South Africa had addressed the underlying cause of the uh, confrontation in Southern Africa by uh, facilitating the constitutional transformation of South Africa. It had been removed because in terms of the tripartite accord of 1988 between South Africa, Angola, and Cuba, Cuban forces were withdrawn from Southern Africa in 1989, 1990, in conjunction with the uh, implementation of the UN's plan for the independence of Namibia. And then, of course, the cherry on the cake was the fall of the Berlin Wall in November, on the 9th of November, 1989. So all of these factors meant that there was no longer a threat. There was no longer any tension with our neighboring states. Uh, and having, having nuclear weapons was simply a burden. Uh, de Klerk wanted to make this uh, great leap uh, after becoming president toward a new South Africa, but he didn't want to make the leap encumbered, encumbered by nuclear weapons. So I think those are, those are, are, are perhaps uh, important pointers for the international community. When we look at states that feel that they now must develop nuclear weapons, why? And the circumstances under which existing nuclear states might perhaps be prepared to divest themselves of these terrible weapons. Uh, so that, that basically is my, my opening contribution. Well, thank you very much. I mean, you were there, you were there for this entire process. And yeah, I mean, it was a model, a model achievement. Um, I'd like to now uh, turn it over to Ambassador Duarte. Uh, he, he, he also has been in a vantage point of not only the United Nations system, but also in the creation of a nuclear weapons free zone in, uh, in Latin America that is not, not an insignificant achievement. Ambassador Duarte? I think you're muted. Ambassador Duarte, I think you're muted. I okay. was muted. Now, now there you I, go. I, I recovered my voice. <laughs> you're perfect. You're perfect. Here I am. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you for hosting this, this uh, discussion. And thank, uh, thank also Basha Stewart and the organizers for inviting me to the celebration of the 30th anniversary of uh, President de Klerk's historic decision to renounce and dismantle South Africa's existing arsenal of nuclear weapons. South Africa's determination to develop a nuclear program dates back from the 1950s, as I know, and was based on elements specific to the country's internal politics and to the regional and world situation at the time. The shift from a civilian nuclear program to the acquisition of nuclear weapons seems to have been driven primarily by a feeling of insecurity that grew as South Africa feared encirclement and hostile action by the new states that were gaining independence from former colonial powers in the southern part of the African continent. In the second half of 1980s, domestic and international rejection of the apartheid policies of the governing national party were growing, mostly through the action of, by the uh, African National Congress under the leadership of Nelson Mandela. In 1991, the Turk assumed the presidency of the country and South Africa quickly shut down 
the nuclear test site in the Kalahari Desert, closed its enrichment facility of uranium, and joined the NPT as a non nuclear state. A special IAEA inspection unit verified the complete termination of the country's nuclear weapon program, allowing the clerk to make the declaration that the six and a half as Ambassador Stewart told us, uh, nuclear weapons secretly built by South Africa had been, had been uh, dismantled. Proliferation of nuclear weapons was at the time a major international issue, both within and outside the United Nations. Atomic armament had begin, begun to proliferate in 1945 with the first experimental detonation of an atomic device by the United States. And by the mid 1960s, four other nations had already acquired nuclear arsenals, and the world had become increased, increasingly concerned with the prospect of further proliferation. Because of its racial discriminatory policies, South Africa was suspended from participation in the United Nations from 1974 until 1994, but continued to devote close attention to multilateral issues linked to arms control and disarmament. In 1965, the 18 National Disarmament Committee was requested by the Assembly to negotiate a treaty to prevent the further spread of nuclear weapons. After three years of deliberations, lack of consensus on a draft NPT prompted the two co-chairs of the ENDC, who were the representative of the United States of the Soviet Union, to send their own proposal to the General Assembly. The Assembly adopted Resolution 2373 commending the treaty and requesting the depositaries to open it to the signature of the state. The result of the vote of that resolution made clear that at the time, several members of the international committee was not ready to accept limitations to the nuclear activities. But despite these hesitations, the NPT entered into force in 1970 and eventually became the most adhered to instrument in the field of disarmament and arms control. Its near universalization was a slow progress, slow process. South Africa acceded to it 20 years later in 1991. Among its neighbor, Mozambique joined in 1990, Zimbabwe in 1991, Namibia in 1992, and Angola in 1996. A number of other significant countries such as Spain, Argentina, Brazil, and Cuba also did not immediately accede to the NPT. The non-proliferation regime instituted by the treaty received a boost when three former Soviet republics, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine, returned to the Soviet Union the nuclear weapons that were in their territories and signed and ratified the NPT. Today, all but four members of the United Nations are party to the treaty. Even during the period of its suspension from the United Nations, South African diplomacy and academia became very much involved in nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament affairs. In 1994, Pretoria sought membership in the 18 nation disarmament committee. The South African delegation was very active at the review and extension conference of the NPT in 1995. Many non-nuclear parties favored a 25 year extension, while the nuclear weapons ones and their allies insisted, insisted on an indefinite extension. Much pressure was exerted by the latter to a secure indefinite extension, including solemn political promises of a renewed emphasis on disarmament. Agreement on a decision on a set of principles and objectives of nuclear disarmament proposed by South Africa at that conference was an important part of the package that allowed the president of the conference, Ambassador Jainata Danapala, to declare that there was no objection to the indefinite extension. An enhanced review process also promoted by South Africa and a resolution calling on states to take practical steps for achieving the establishment of a zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East completed the package. Today, 27 years later, no progress has been made on the holding of the Middle East Conference. Likewise, the promises made by local weapon states in their effort to win the indefinite extension of the NPT seem now completely forgotten. As a matter of fact, very little progress has been made towards nuclear disarmament at all. Many non nuclear parts of the NPC continue to argue that indefinite extension does not mean or should not be taken to mean indefinite possession. Against such a background, 
South Africa's evolution from a nuclear weapon state to a dedicated support of non-proliferation and disarmament is a bright example for the whole international community. Together with climate change, the continued existence of nuclear weapons is the greatest threat to peace and security in the planet. We commemorate today not only President Kerr's wise decision, but also South Africa's invaluable contribution to the effort to rid the world from the most cruel and humane weapon ever designed. The world cannot be condemned to live forever under the threat of its own extinction. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I know that Ambassador Graham was very much involved in leading the U.S. delegation to obtain the indefinite extension of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and, and negotiating those promises that led to its indefinite extension, including uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which he led in getting the United States to sign. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that he, that he can talk about his direct experience in uh, being in South Africa, uh, negotiating that extension and observing the elimination of, of, of South Africa's arsenal. I just want to say it is commendable that both South Africa and uh, Brazil uh, have been active members of the New Agenda Coalition, a coalition of six nations, including New Zealand, Mexico, Ireland, and Egypt, focused on uh, ensuring progress in fulfilling those commitments that you alluded to pursuant to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and walking us to a nuclear weapons-free world. And I strongly want to emphasize how important it is that the nuclear weapon states get back on board and live up to the promises that they have made. Ambassador Graham, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me to appear on this distinguished panel. And it's an honor to be on the panel with ambassadors uh, uh, Stewart and, and Duarte. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time with uh, Sergio in the good old days um, on these issues. Um, as I start, uh, I would like to make a comment on why I think nu uh, countries pursue nuclear weapons. There is no one reason. It's different for different countries. Uh, for Great Britain, it was clear. Uh, Harold Macmillan said our additional contribution, which is what he called nuclear weapons, our additional contribution puts us right where we should be, a great power. That was their reason. Uh, whereas uh, a country like uh, Israel, uh, uh, or um, um, even North Korea, uh, India, Pakistan, they all have different reasons, but they all center around perceived security. Uh, usually the perception is flawed. No, I shouldn't say that. Often the perception is flawed, but sometimes it's prestige. Sometimes it's... Uh, protection against, like Pakistan, protection against your neighbor. And uh, there's just different reasons. And there's no, for the most part, there's no good or bad in most cases. I wouldn't say all cases. Uh, we're getting a demonstration right now that why it's dangerous to have nuclear weapons around because they fall into the hands of the uh, kind of people that have been talking to each other recently um, uh, who might use them. Uh, but that doesn't mean that was the original reason in all cases that, that, that they acquired them. Um, I uh, was uh, given the, uh, the assignment of, of leading the U.S. government on the issue of uh, indefinite extension um, uh, from the very, uh, from our beginning in, in this effort. Of course, there were other higher up people at the end who uh, 
uh, became involved, like the Secretary of State and so forth. But uh, I, I was a sort of a, a field person. And um, uh, we decided early on that one country we just had to have if we were going to prevail was South Africa. They had had the bomb and they had given it up and um, Mandela was their president. And the first thing that, that, that I did in, uh, in coordination with others in the government is I tried to appeal directly to President Mandela. And I went to um, the South African desk in, in the State Department and said, who in the U.S., uh, well, who in the U.S. would uh, President Mandela listen to? And, and the, I was told two, two people, Henry Kissinger and um, Colin Powell. Well, I didn't really know Henry Kissinger, but I did know Colin Powell. So I placed a call to where, where he then was uh, out of government. Wasn't much different than trying to get him in government. And um, I had to make an appointment for a phone call and finally I got him on the phone. And uh, I told him what my project was for him to write a letter to President Mandela asking him to support us in an indefinite extension. And, uh, and, and he said, why me? And as I said, I was advised uh, uh, that you were one of two Americans that President Mandela might listen to. And uh, he said, who's the other one? Mm -hmm. And I said, Henry Kissinger. And he said, I've made the big time at last. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he did write the letter. It was a beautiful letter. I don't know what effect it had, but anyway, it was written. And then later on, um, a month or two later, uh, my assistant, Susan Burke, and I made a trip to, uh, to South Africa to put in our two bits of persuasion uh, uh, for South Africa. And uh, we spent the first day uh, talking to the foreign ministry and, and saying what a good thing indefinite extension was. And they made it clear from the beginning that they were not against indefinite extension, although a lot of people thought they were. Uh, they said they just, they, won't, they wanted it to happen, but they wanted it to happen in a way that would bring countries together not separate them. And so the next day we were there, they showed us their program and they claimed that we were the first Americans to see all this um, after, after the two people on the IAEA inspection team that cleared them for the, uh, for the uh, NPT. And uh, they took us to their um, uh, enrichment plant for highly enriched uranium, which was shut down, which was a beautiful new plant. Uh, and, uh, and then they took us over to Pelandaba, which isn't, wasn't far away. And um, um, uh, they took us to this unassuming looking building. And they said, uh, this, is where we, this is where we put them together. And uh, they, they uh, said, look around you in this shop where we put them together. You won't find anything here that's not in a high, high school machine shop. Our point is that anybody can build these things. They're not that complicated. If you have the, the engineers, uh, reasonably educated engineers, and, to do it in the material, of course. And, and so uh, we want you to watch out because other people are gonna to try to do this. And then, then we got a lecture from uh, 
a high official who uh, laid out the South African strategic policy. And he said, well, the reason we built them was we had all these Cubans over in Angola and we were afraid they would attack us and nobody would come to our defense. So we thought we could get the United States to come to our defense if we detonated a nuclear bomb in the middle of the Kalahari and said, look what we've got. And, uh, and then they would come rushing over to try to make peace. Uh, but if they didn't do that, uh, we didn't have any second step. Uh, uh, that was that was that was the policy, and, and uh, uh, it didn't sound all that logical to me. But then you know I, I wasn't in their in their position, and and then as the months passed, uh, we um, heard that. South Africa was working on this question and and uh, they came to a conclusion and uh, John Holm, who was the director of the Arms Control Agency and I, who was the, you might say, non-proliferation and arms control negotiator, uh, uh, were asked to come to Holm, we were brought to Holm's office and um, the South African ambassador came in and he said, uh, I wanted to deliver this to you in person. We have decided to support indefinite extension, but in the way that we told you in Pretoria, uh, in a way that would uh, bring, bring countries together, not separate them. And we want, we want it inextricably linked to progress and disarmament uh, and, and improvement in the NPT process. And that's what in the negotiations that followed led to the statement of principles and objectives and, and the enhanced uh, review. Um, and uh, the, uh, I don't know what your, your reaction will be to this, but, but I, I can't help but tell this little brief story about that meeting because it, it, it affected me so deeply. Um, the, after we had finished all this uh, uh, serious stuff about nuclear weapons, the, the uh, South African ambassador sort of relaxed and <clears throat> talked a little bit about Mandela. He had apparently been uh, on Rikers Island for a while himself and, and, and knew the president well. And he said, <clears throat> you will no doubt notice that the president um, never gives a biblical citation for something that he does or wants to do because the Bible was used to justify uh, apartheid. But what rather what he does is try to understand, if you'll forgive, forgive me, is to try to understand what Jesus would have him do and then do it. And that's pretty, that's an unusual a statement to hear from a foreign amb ambassador, but it's always been with me since. And uh, indeed, when the when the conference came, South Africa did took the lead. I don't think. I mean, my position was we're we as uh, it was. Uh, I was many people tried to push me out of it, but. My position was we were going to go to the to the end for indefinite extension, and if we won by one vote, we won by one vote, and uh, that seemed to um, bother some because they thought that's the way it might turn out, and the NATO would support us, and a lot of others wouldn't, and and so um, I think that that actually helped our position, but I, 
I, I, uh, I stuck with it and they stuck with theirs. And uh, the result was an extremely good one, I think. Uh, the, it strengthened the NPT and made it permanent, which uh, that's a, um, uh, you might say a win-win. And for a while, it looked like uh, the NPT was going to go from strength to strength, but that only lasted about 10 years. And it's been in semi-decline ever since. And frankly, unless people begin, less serious people around the world begin to take it seriously, to, to understand how threatened it is by Putin, by Xi, by climate change, uh, and by lots of other things, uh, or just plain lack of interest, it's not gonna last. Uh, one of our primary objectives in this diplomatic life should be preserve the NPT, and strengthen it as much as we can. And that way, someday, uh, nuclear weapons will go, but it won't be soon. But, but someday it'll happen if, if, we, if we stay with the fight and also fight climate change at the same time. Thank you, Ambassador Graham. I'd now like to have a round of, of uh, response uh, to where we are today, right now, with uh, all this nine states with nuclear weapons, either modernizing and or simultaneously expanding their arsenals and expanding the ways in which they might be used, the reaffirmation of military nationalism as the main framework of security rather than human security or global security or planetary realism, whatever you want to call it, or collectively and cooperatively addressing the existential threats such as climate, oceanic health, rainforests. Uh, but what are, you know, what, where, uh, Ambassador uh, Stewart, where do you think we are? What are the suggestions that you have that can get us out of the uh, critical moment that we're in? And uh, let me just say that to me, the most, the most serious part of the, this critical moment um, is the fact that very reasonable promises were made for the indefinite extension of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which contains the commitment to disarmament and duty to negotiate disarmament in the treaty, and that those commitments were strengthened in 2000, were strengthened again in 2010, but they haven't been fulfilled. And the failure to live up to promises I find to be the most disturbing uh, phenomena of the relationship between nations with these devices. Ambassador Stewart. Jonathan, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm particularly concerned with uh, the current uh, state of the world as far as nuclear weapons are concerned because of the new volatility in international relations. The tectonic plates are shifting. Uh, the old rigid certainties of the Cold War are gone and you now have situations where countries no longer feel secure uh, that the United States is going to come to their defense if they're attacked by uh, an, another superpower. Uh, you have the, the situation of Ukraine. Ukraine, which gave up its nuclear weapons uh, in the early 1990s on the express understanding that there would be no uh, attack on its territory. Now, what would the Ukrainians think about that decision now? And what, what conclusions are other countries reaching in the face of that uh, existential threat? What do, what do the countries in, the, in Central Europe think about the threat now from Russia? Can they be assured that NATO will spring to their defense? So I think things are changing. The, 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 uh, we live in a much more volatile world. There is uncertainty. Uh, there are powerful states with powerful uh, conventional forces. Weaker states are going to look for their security somewhere. And the problem is that 
the, the nuclear weapon states have done nothing really to live up to their responsibilities in terms of the NPT in the meantime. So you're getting this division of the world into two classes of state, the, those who've got nuclear weapons and those who don't. And many of the nuclear weapon, the non-nuclear weapon states, I think are going to be feeling increasingly insecure in the period that lies ahead. So this is really a time uh, for, the, for the world to address the current threats, particularly the war in Ukraine. That really has to be stopped before it spirals out of control in one direction or another. Countries have to feel secure so that they do not feel the need to run to a nuclear weapons defense system. So a lot of this depends on the way that the existing nuclear weapons powers are going to meet their responsibilities in terms of the existing treaties and particularly the non-nuclear non-proliferation treaty. So it's a critical time in my, in my view. Thank you. Ambassador Duarte, um, I, 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 I did want to just make sure that we do bring to the audience's attention the fact that, uh, that there are uh, nuclear weapons free zones. Uh, South Africa was instrumental in creating the nuclear weapons free zone of Africa, the Treaty of Palindabra. They have beautiful names. And of course, Brazil is a participant in the Treaty of Tlatelolco, making Latin America nuclear weapons free, Treaty of Rarotango, making the South Pacific, the Treaty of Bangkok, making Southeast Asia, the Treaty of Astana, making Central Asia nuclear weapons free. That's 115 countries uh, in these nuclear weapons free zones. This is a success story. And then, of course, there is a treaty that uh, none of the nuclear weapon states have joined prohibiting e the prohibition treaty, even prohibiting the possession. So there are, uh, there are movements simultaneously by states without nuclear weapons pushing for progress on the agenda. And I wanted to ask Ambassador Duarte, what are his suggestions of how we might get out of the current quagmire and move forward? Well, thank you, Jonathan. I really don't know how to get out of the quagmire. And I really regret that we got into it. But in any way, uh, we have today, as Ambassador Stewart just pointed out, a very dangerous situation, both regarding climate change and the existence of nuclear weapons and the willingness of the possessors of nuclear weapons to use them. They have been used once. There's no reason to believe why they would not be used a second time maybe, maybe uh, by uh, someone else. But uh, if they are used, uh, the, the harm will not be done only to those who are bombed by a, a nuclear weapon, but for the, all of us, because surely there would be a retaliation, there would be consequences. And if we uh, uh, evolve to an all out uh, nuclear exchange, then perhaps civilization as we know it uh, may not survive. Mm -hmm. And the same thing may happen if we don't take uh, serious steps about climate change. Now about the, the you mentioned the uh, nuclear weapon free zones. Brazil was the country that proposed for the first time a nuclear weapon free zone in Latin America. This was in 61 at the General Assembly of the United Nations. And at the time, the two uh, main possessors of nuclear weapons, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, dismissed that, that suggestion, thought it was not appropriate for that time. But next year, with the Cuban uh, Missile Crisis, then they had second thoughts about it and thought it would be a good idea to try to denuclearize uh, Latin America in terms of weapons. I don't like the term denuclearization because it, it <laughs> embraces also uh, civilian uh, uh, uses, but anyway, uh, uh, at that time, they thought it was a good idea, uh, uh, which I had not thought, which I had they, they changed their mind from one year before. But then it progressed. The, at that time, uh, soon in Latin America, in some countries, including my own, uh, uh, military governments take over, took over in several different countries. And it, 
and this retarded for some time uh, progress on the on the nuclear uh, prison. But in any case, the even with military governments, uh, uh, it went on, and uh, we were able in 1967, a few months before uh, the the NPT. Uh, uh, to uh, put together the Nuclear Weapon Free Zone. Part of that was uh, reachable because of an, uh, an agreement between Brazil and Argentina that they would not uh, build nuclear weapons and they would constitute, as they did, uh, an organization uh, uh, to uh, watch over uh, one another so that confidence was there. This was in 1991 that this uh, came about. And uh, since then, we have now about 30 years that uh, this uh, agreement uh, is working. And I do not believe that either Brazil or Argentina, or for that matter, any other country in the South American, uh, Latin American, and in the Caribbean uh, region would uh, uh, think of uh, building nuclear weapons. I think this is well in the past. And I'm glad that uh, the example that Latin America did uh, was emulated uh, by Africa, by South, Southeast of Asia, by Central Asia, by the Pacific countries, uh, and so on and so forth. It's unfortunate uh, that only one of these countries is above the equator. Only one of these uh, re uh, reasons is above the equator. We hope that uh, some other countries above the equator will also take the same example. It is a very sound and very good example that should be followed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Graham, uh, uh, you're you're muted. Uh, Tom, you're muted. Tom, you're muted. I ju I just okay. wanted to express my full agreement with what both speakers have said, but in particular something that uh, Ambassador Stewart said about countries wanting security. Um, <clears throat> nuclear weapons do not stand alone uh, where um, uh, commitments have been violated. The US gave Ukraine when it gave up, I was involved with, and so I remember the exchanges, um, <clears throat> the, um, the U U.S. was not, did not only give in other uh, nuclear weapon states, did not only give uh, assurances <clears throat> in connection with nuclear weapons, um, and, but uh, they gave them with respect to Ukraine if they would give up their weapons. And the United States said that um, uh, along with um, the UK and Russia, that they would guarantee uh, Ukraine's borders if it would give up the UK nuclear weapons, 5,000 of them, by the way, if it would give up its nuclear weapons and, uh, quote, return, close quote, them to Russia. And uh, South Africa, um, Ukraine did not want to do that. And uh, it took many, many, many a conversation with them, and many, many a pledge. And I made some of them myself. And, and uh, the US said that we would, along with the other two, guarantee um, um, Ukraine's borders, and we said alone that we would give it the force of a treaty in our system, a treaty. A treaty comes with obligations. Ukraine took that seriously and gave up the third largest nuclear weapon stockpile in the world. And, and if they had kept it, um, they wouldn't be doing what they were doing, but they are doing today. And so um, promises not kept have results. And that is a very, what's happened is a very bad result, which could lead to um, um, very, very serious consequences 
if, if a way out isn't found reasonably soon. Thank you, Ambassador Graham. I know I, know I observed, uh, and, and as a civil society activist pushing for the abolition of nuclear weapons, I was one of the people pushing you uh, and supporting your efforts while you were in the government, uh, pushing because of uh, the insight of Senator Alan Krantz in that nuclear weapons are unworthy of civilization, or the insight of Secretary of Defense uh, Perry, or, the, or Secretary of Defense McNamara, that nuclear weapons are suicidal against a state that has them, patently immoral and illegal against the state that doesn't have them, and of no use <coughs> against terrorists. But I wanted to point out a few suggestions that we might advance. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Joe Biden ran on a policy uh, that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons is to prevent them from being used. That's an implicit no first use pledge. And I think we have an obligation to advance that and demand that the United States live up to that promise and advance a no, uh, uh, institutionalizing no first use of nuclear weapons in the Security Council, certainly a General Assembly resolution. Um, it is just common sense that countries that have renounced nuclear weapons should be provided negative security assurances in a more formalized way that if you've given up the weapons, you shouldn't be threatened with them. That's common sense. And there is, a, there, as, as we all know, there is an obligation to negotiate elimination. But what is, seems to me to be happening is diplomats are negotiating in the context of the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, in the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conferences, in good faith. But when they go back to their capitals, they're not able to deliver because the dove of disarmament doesn't get in the room. The turtle of strategic stability is marginalized by the stallion and attractiveness of the pursuit of military advantage. That is now leading to the worst of all possible conditions, a ignoring of previous pledges and an arms race. So we have to redouble our efforts. It doesn't matter whether, whether the public understands it, we understand it. We know, we know that humanity is placed at risk. And I think nuclear weapons institutionalize adversity when we need to cooperate to protect the climate. And in that regard, I noticed a colleague of ours, and I want to highlight his work, Dr. Marty Hellman, who is uh, at Stanford. He was, he's a brilliant uh, engine, computer engineer and polymath who helped create the encryption system that allows us to utilize the internet. And he's been calling on rethinking the paradigm of national security and highlighting that no nation can be secure if we don't have global security or human security. And that rethinking, that rethinking is, in my opinion, planetary realism, because as been, has been highlighted, there are two existential threats that no other generation has ever faced. And neither of them can be met from a national perspective, no matter how much money we spend on military hardware and, and technologies of destruction, we will not protect our climate, we will not be able to protect the oceans, we will not deal with pandemics. So these are things that are that give us a new moment of human opportunity. And, uh, and it's not being seized. And we're not making the case strongly enough. And that's on us, the people that are listening to this, who truly care and are able psychologically to look at with sobriety at the danger that we face. And I want to personally thank Ambassador Duarte, Ambassador Graham, and Ambassador Stewart for the progress that they have made, that the work that they have done. And I'd like to hand this over to Ambassador Stewart to close out and tell us a little bit about uh, the Willem de Klerk Foundation, where he is now the leader, and uh, and thank him for organizing this important uh, panel that should be shared and um, and that we we have we have not come up with any simple solutions, which means there is a real need for more discussion, more dialogue, more debate, and more action. Ambassador Stewart. 
Well, Jonathan, thank you very much. And thank you also for the role that you've played in putting this panel discussion together. F.W. de Klerk used a very interesting image when he spoke about nuclear weapons. He said that they are like the Gollum's ring from the Lord of the Rings. This is the power that is so attractive that uh, once you become involved with it, you find it very, very difficult to discard. It changes your personality. It warps you. And it's only when that Gollum's ring is finally thrown into the volcano and destroyed that its bearers are liberated. And I think this is very much the challenge that we face in the international community. Lip service is given to nuclear disarmament and to the goals of the NPT, but nobody wants to get rid of the Gollum's ring. Yet this is a, a uh, an absolutely existential threat to humanity. I wish we had somebody from ICANN here to explain to people watching this, this panel discussion the actual horror of a nuclear weapons exchange. Uh, when one considers that the, just the, the Russian nuclear fleet has 1,600 nuclear uh, warheads that it can place on cities all over the world. And that's just a fraction of the, of the total. And if more than 400 of these go off at, at any single time, then you have a catastrophe, not just for the target countries, but for the world, because it creates a global winter for a decade or more. So this, I really think, is uh, the seminal challenge for humanity now. We've got to stop the war in the Ukraine. It holds the threat, even if it's a 1% threat of nuclear ex escalation, we've got to stop that. We've got to get the nuclear weapon states to reaffirm and do something about their <coughs> undertakings in terms of the NPT and other <coughs> And we hope that, that this 30th anniversary of F.W. de Klerk's announcement that South Africa had given up its nuclear weapons will help to focus international attention on this crucially important point. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, Ambassador, Ambassador Duarte. Thank you, Ambassador Graham. And once again, thank you so much, Jonathan, uh, the F.W. de Klerk Foundation. Our main purpose is to continue to uphold the constitution that ushered in a new South Africa based on non-racialism and constitutional democracy. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Jonathan, for your role. David, I am going to just close out with one unique point. The wise from time immemorial have admonished us to, for our own humanity to see the human family as one, as, uh, as a spiritual, moral insight, to treat your neighbor as yourself. And today, neighborhood is not a physical location. It is the whole planet. It is a moral location. We stand at a unique moment in which there's a convergence of practical necessity and moral imperative. This, practic this convergence has never happened with humanity before. And I believe that that, is where the, that insight is where the energy for change will happen. And I know that it was that moral insight that led you and President de Klerk to take those courageous steps where you put your lives at risk to end the, the horrors of apartheid. And we need to end the apartheid of the haves and have nots of nuclear weapons and get rid of these devices. Thank you so much. Thank you. We should get rid of the bombs. We should dismantle these weapons. I think a fair dispensation would be to reach international agreement 
on the systematic phasing out of nuclear weapons.